Welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness. Military personnel are used to facing the enemy and being at war. But every now and then, they face an enemy that can't be seen, and weapons are useless against them. That's right, they have to deal with ghosts. Be sure to join me here every Thursday at 5 p.m. for new content. And if you like tonight's video, give it a thumbs up, share the link, and comment below. YouTube needs those things to live, so we'd better give it to them. But for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way. And let's get scared together, 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 together. I was in the Navy as an avionics technician. Back in 2011, I was stationed in Afghanistan. Our patrol base was built along a wide canal, and there was a village just a few hundred meters away. One day my squad and I had to take a census of the village and gather whatever information we could about the locals there. There weren't many people, just a small marketplace and about five or six families. There were also a lot of empty buildings. All of the families were quite young, too. Some didn't have any children yet, which for Afghanistan is pretty weird. There was one guy that stood out above the rest, an old man named Bashar. He was the only person in his village older than 30. We started talking to him, and he told us the story of his village and of another census that was taken there years ago. And what a story it was. Back during the Soviet-Afghan War, he lived there with his wife and three children. There were also many other families there at that time as well, and they all belonged to the same tribe. Bashar had been lucky enough to attend school in a nearby town, and he spoke English, Russian, Farsi, and a few other languages. This would ultimately be his saving grace. One day, a group of Soviet soldiers showed up and asked who in the village could speak Russian. Bashar was the only one who could, so he stepped forward. After they confirmed that he could indeed both speak and read in their language, the Soviets swept through the entire village and killed every single person there except him. Men, women, children, the elderly, every last person was slaughtered with the exception of Bashar. They even killed his wife and children while he watched. They then forced him to go through the entire village and identify every one of the bodies. They had him write down their names and turn the master list over to the Soviet platoon commander. That's how they did their census. Once they had the list of names, they left and never returned to the village ever again. So there was no reason for them to do what they had done aside from hatred and spite. After that, Bashar became a soldier himself, intent on avenging the lives of his people. But before he could set out to exact his revenge, Bashar had to bury every single body that the Soviets had slaughtered. According to Islamic custom, bodies are supposed to be buried within 24 hours of their death. But some of those people were denied even that basic dignity. He never said how long it took him, but eventually he was able to bury them all. Now, I didn't know about any of this until after what I'm about to tell you. The bodies were buried right next to our base, and there were a lot of them. Fast forward to 2011. I was outside on night duty by myself at the base, when out of nowhere I started hearing immense amounts of gunfire coming from the direction of the village. At first I thought there was a wedding going on, if you've ever been to an Afghan wedding, then you'll know what I mean. It was far too late for it to be the Taliban, since they don't like to be out at night, and definitely don't want to be that close to a military base. So I radioed over to the other post to see if they knew what was going on. But they had no clue what I was even talking about. The Marine on duty was a guy I knew very well, and he was a very serious man. He wouldn't be joking around with me. The guy completely denied hearing any gunfire or seeing anything. He had absolutely no idea what I was hearing, because no one else was hearing it but me. Then the screaming started. I'll never forget that sound as long as I live. It was a wailing like I'd never heard before, 
And it wasn't just one person. It sounded like there were dozens and dozens of people screaming. Agonizing, blood-curdling yells were punctuated by a crescendo of gunfire. This went on for several long minutes. And then, the gunfire died down, and I could hear moaning, and what clearly sounded like children, crying. After that, it was dead silent. No noise was heard for the next two hours until my relief came. I left my post bewildered, and I tried to pass it off as delusions caused by lack of sleep. The next morning I woke up and I went to find the Marine who had relieved me. I asked him how it went the night before, and he replied that he didn't want to talk about it. I pried a little more because his reply piqued my interest. He then proceeded to relate to me the exact same thing that happened to me. Everything was the same. He was visibly shaken when I told him that I had heard those things too. We started asking around, and we found that no fewer than four other Marines had experienced the exact same thing, but only on night watch and only at that particular post. I never believed in the paranormal, but that day, I gave it more credence than I ever did before. I still can't explain what happened or why. I only know what I heard and that I wasn't the only one it happened to. Everyone who ever stood watch at that post swore that the place was haunted. It was certainly one of my strangest and, frankly, the most unsettling thing that's ever happened to me. And I imagine it'll remain that way for quite some time to come. This is my dad's story. He was stationed at an Air Force base in Greenland. They often had blizzards there, and when they did, the base would be put on lockdown and they'd take roll call to make sure that everyone was accounted for. These blizzards were intense. They had to have cables running between all of the buildings, and you had to attach a carabiner to yourself and them so that if there was a sudden whiteout, you didn't get lost and die. They had people die literally 20 feet from shelter because they got lost in the blinding snow and froze to death. Dad said there was about a five-month period where every time they went on lockdown, they'd hear horrendous screaming outside. But after taking a head count, all personnel were accounted for, so they couldn't risk sending anybody out to investigate. It was just too dangerous in the snow. At first, they tried to write it off as an animal. However, every time the screaming was heard, the next day, they'd find the engine room torn up. Tools would be thrown everywhere, Paperwork was all over the floor, and tables and toolboxes were knocked over. One time, even a 3,000-pound jet engine was lifted off its crane and smashed to the floor almost 30 feet away from where it was hanging. The hangars and engine room all had surveillance cameras covering every single entrance and spotlights. The lights made it possible for the cameras to see the doors even during whiteout conditions. But no animals, no people... No anything was ever seen entering or leaving those buildings. After one such incident, a U-2 plane in the shop had all of its electronics turned on. The systems on that plane were specifically built for that particular crew's mission. They were complex and archaic, and it wasn't a simple matter of hitting a power button or flipping switches from off to on. Very few people knew how to operate that machinery for it. And the only ones on the base who could were two engineers, and they were in lockdown and accounted for when it happened. Another time, three barrels of heavy hydraulic fluid vanished and were never seen again. Then one day, it all just stopped. But this was not something that the military just shrugged off. It cost a lot of money every time that place was trashed, and it threw a wrench into at least one surveillance mission that we know of. That caused the brass at the DOD and the CIA to breathe fire down the neck of the base commander. The facility, aside from its military function, also served as a base for a lot of civilian research as well. So they launched a full investigation into the matter, using scientists, engineers, and specialists of all kinds. But they were never able to come up with a satisfactory explanation for what was happening. 
While they didn't know what was causing it, they doubted that the screaming noise was the wind because it came in short, irregular bursts. Also, while monitoring our systems, they picked up on a bunch of weird interference and had anomalous readings on the nights that it would happen. And they were never able to reproduce those errors in a controlled setting. As a Marine, I used to work the graveyard patrol shift at the Beirut Bombing Memorial. Part of it is dedicated to a veteran's cemetery. Oddly enough, though, I never got freaked out about being alone in a remote cemetery at night, surrounded by dense woods on all sides. I actually found it kind of peaceful, to be honest. However, one night while patrolling near the perimeter where the oldest headstones are located, I heard the sound of a woman humming. I followed the sound and noticed a light glowing through the vines and brush of a large tree. As I approached, I could feel my hair beginning to lift up, like there was an electrical current in the air. I pushed aside the brush, and what I saw took my breath away. It was an old weathered headstone with a large marble cross, only the cross was glowing bright vivid blue, like a neon sign. The humming suddenly became much louder and had a weird plurality to it, like it was coming from hundreds of people at the same time. I'm not ashamed to say that I screamed like a little girl, sprinted back to the parking lot, got on the radio and called the guard who was supposed to relieve me. I pretty much forced him to come in early. Then, I spent the rest of my shift in the cab of his truck with him, cowering. I didn't think he believed me when I told him what I saw but he stayed in the truck the entire time and didn't go out on patrol until the sun was up, so maybe he did believe me. A few days later, I finally worked up the nerve to go back and look at that grave. During the day, of course. But in the light of day, it was a completely mundane headstone. There was no name on it, only the cross. I ran my hands over the stone to check to see if maybe there was some sort of hidden light source or a solar panel. But no, it was just a plain, solid, unremarkable stone, and the humming was gone too. Eventually, I returned to my normal shift, and I never experienced anything out of the ordinary again. I also never learned whose grave it was either, but I find myself thinking about it from time to time. I know it sounds absurd when I tell this story out loud. I suppose I could have been hallucinating, or it was a trick of a tired brain, but I don't believe it was. I think it was real, a ghost or a spirit of some sort, but I don't think it was malevolent at all. I was in the Navy as an avionics technician. I didn't believe in the paranormal then, and I still don't now, but what happened to me was just plain weird. It was during the last few years of the Angolian Civil War. I was a gunner by trade, but got tired of the other side taking pot shots at me with their mortars, so I was able to land a cushy job as a radio operator. We had a platoon of 12, a lieutenant, 10 gunners, and me, and we were guarding a base that was built for 500 troops. But the fighting had shifted further west, and the base was practically empty, except for us. I worked in a building that was about 500 feet in circumference and consisted of a large sand wall with sandbags and barbed wire on top. The sand wall was built over a semicircle pipe. It looked similar to this one. In the middle of the bunker was my radio station. It was just a single desk with the radio controls on it. Here's a picture of what one looks like. On one side of the structure, they had a sleeping quarter for the lieutenant, and on the other, the entrance. It was eight feet across and 60 feet long with a curved ceiling so you could only walk upright down the middle. I had the midnight to 6 a.m. shift and as usual, it was quiet. The generator was shut off so the radio was running on battery power and I had a few candles lit so I could see. We had to check in with the other bases every hour, but other than that, there really wasn't much to do. To cut the boredom, Sometimes we'd listen to the Cubans on the radio. 
or just read books and magazines. I'd adopted a kitten who was asleep on my lap, and there was also a dog that the entire base had adopted, and he was lying at my feet. The kitten was totally fearless, but the dog had been abused before we found him, and he was timid, not used to being treated kindly. But I'd bonded with both animals, and they always followed me everywhere. So I was reading around 2 a.m., when the cat suddenly jolted awake, and it dug its claws into me. Just a second later, the dog woke up, alert. It was only then that I heard the sound of boots walking slowly down the middle of the bunker from the entrance. By the candlelight, I couldn't see the end of the bunker. So I waited, thinking it was one of the gunners who couldn't sleep, coming by to say hi. But the cat started hissing and backing into my shirt, trying to get away from whatever it was that was approaching us. The footsteps kept advancing, but I still couldn't see anyone. The dog, who had never made any noise besides a whimper, suddenly started growling, and he also started backing into me. Now I was getting a little nervous, but I wasn't sure why. I'm not a jumpy person, but I had goosebumps all over me, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up as the sound of the boots kept getting closer and closer. I should have been able to see the person at that point, yet I saw nothing. Then all three of us, the cat, the dog, and me, started shaking as the boots walked right in front of us, hesitated for a second, then continued walking right past us. But there was no one there. Still shaking and holding the cat in my shirt, I walked down the middle of the bunker, following the sound of the footsteps. I could hear my lieutenant snoring behind the closed bedroom door of his quarters. There was no way anyone could have entered or left that bunker without walking right past me. There was only one entrance, yet there was no one there except me and my sleeping comrade. I turned around and nearly wet myself as I tripped over the dog who was right at my heels. Then the three of us went over to the desk, grabbed my radio and candles, and headed out to the other bunker to be near the other sleeping gunners. I was determined to finish my duty there, after all their safety in numbers. The next day, the others all admitted that they'd also heard people walking around the base, but they had been assuming that they were just hearing things. What it was, I'll never know. And as I said, I don't believe in the paranormal. But those boots clearly and loudly walked straight past me down the middle of that bunker. And there was no one there besides a normally fearless cat who was terrified, a timid dog that uncharacteristically growled at the noise, and me, a skeptic that was so scared my hair stood on end. It looks like no matter what branch of the military you join, or where in the world you get stationed, there's never any shortage of ghosts. They really are everywhere. Thank you so much for listening tonight. All of you are the reason we keep growing this channel together. Without you, there wouldn't be a channel. So as a way to say thank you, I've decided to make every fourth Thursday of the month a premiere video featuring live chat. That means if you're subscribed and you have your notification bell set, 30 minutes prior to the video going live at 5 p.m. Central, you'll be sent a notification. At that time, you can click in and we can all chat for 30 minutes, then watch the video together as the family of darkness. You don't have to be subscribed to attend, though. It just makes it easier because you'll be reminded to show up early. So, until next time... Stay scared, my friends.